Yeah, so we are the uh, Platypus Affiliated Society, and we're going to be hosting a panel on Israel, Palestine, and the left today. Um, we hold reading groups, uh, public forums such as this, uh, journalism, and a print review to investigate uh, the history of the left, the struggles of the left, um, the death of the left, and we uh, are on campuses across America and uh, Europe and Asia. Um, we can uh, talk more after the panel if anyone's interested about the rest of what we do. But um, that being said, I'm just going to introduce all the panelists. Each panelist will have six to eight minutes to give opening remarks, uh, followed by two to three minutes to respond to each other, and then we'll open to the floor to the audience for questions. Um, so Jennifer Kelly is a professor in feminist studies and critical race and ethnic studies at UCSC. She is the author of Invited to Witness, Solidarity Tourism Across Occupied Palestine. C.J. Hunt is an undergraduate student at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, David Walters is a longtime Bay Area activist. He is the founding member and director of the Marxist Internet Archive and the former director of Holt Labor Library. He is also a co-editor of the selected works of Eugene V. Debs. Uh, Alexander Gallus is a recent graduate from UC Berkeley, and he translated the historic accomplishment of Karl Marx by Karl Kautsky from German into English. Uh, so now I'm going to read the uh, panel prompt, which all of the panelists are responding to. Um, and yeah, it is as follows. With an eye towards the specific moments and epochs from the history of the left, how has the left historically approached the question of Israel-Palestine? How does the imagination of leftists today, as concerns what is to be done about the current ongoing Israel-Palestine conflict, fall below the threshold of what leftists in the past thought was possible? Uh, and the order of the speakers will have uh, Jennifer go first, uh, then CJ, then David, and then Alex. That works. So, uh, Jennifer. Sure. Um, so... Um, as you mentioned, I'm, my work is on Palestine. I teach in feminist studies and ethnic studies. Um, the way that I'll approach this um, in our sort of very short time frame is to, one, trouble the idea of a, a unified left history, right? And to not answer how the left has approached Palestine necessarily, but how and to what extent Palestinians and Arab Americans have more broadly been part of left organizing. So I, want, I would point you all to Pamela Pennock's work, The Rise of the Arab American Left, um, and what she describes as the near omission of Arab American activism in histories of the left in the United States. So she notes that while ethnic studies literature on third world left movements uh, dutifully examines African American, Latino American, Asian American, and Native American activism, often leaves out history of Arab American activism and the centrality of Palestine to coalitional organizing during this time. So this is overlooking sort of um, Arab American activist role in the anti-imperial movements of the 60s through the 80s, and then misses an, an opportunity to understand histories of Arab American coalition building in spite of escalating government surveillance, which is particularly relevant, of course, to today. So a central organizing strategy for many Amer Arab American activists was to simultaneously work to combat racism in the U.S. as one iteration of home while also organizing against U.S. and Israeli ravaging of their countries of origin, underscoring the need for a more complex understanding of what constitutes home for populations in the United States that are subject to state-sanctioned racism within the nation's borders, and also contending with the long-term intergenerational ramifications of U.S. empire. This couldn't be more relevant now for Arab American and Palestinian students on day 60 of a genocide against Palestinian people in Gaza, a time of racist warmongering perpetrated by government officials, administrators, and mainstream media outlets. This rhetoric, alongside the administrative willingness to position work and scholarship on Palestine as having no place in the classroom, is responsible for the disparaging of and violence against protesters, teaching attendees, and vigil participants in support of Palestinian freedom on campuses across the U.S. Students and staff and faculty in support of Palestine, including here at UFCSC, have long been subject to attacks disparaging our work. The scope and scale of intimidation and threats grows every day. We know that universities are under immense pressure from trustees, alumni, and donors to be perceived as pro-Israel, even at the cost of violating academic freedom and free speech rights. 
Students nationwide are under increasing threats and attacks, including from university leadership that refuses to protect them from harassment, instead actively punishes them for speaking up, from employers that fire them or reverse decisions to hire them, from the U.S. Senate, which has dangerously equated criticism of the state of Israel with anti-Semitism and called pro-Palestine students morally repugnant, and House Resolution 894, which passed last night and dangerously conflates anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. One of the things that this book that I'm referencing does, Pennock's book, is talk about court cases, Arab American activist papers, it's an interdisciplinary his history, and student organizing flyers from Michigan, Kansas, and California. The effect is a sort of cumulative revealing of the depth and breadth of Arab American activism from 67 to, until the first Intifada in 87, and the tensions and collaborations and coalitions of Arab American activists and between Arab American activists and other activists of color in the United States. Palestine and its erasure, both on the ground and in historical narratives, is at the center of Arab American anti-racist and anti-imperial organizing. At the same time, Arab American actors are center, central to the story about Palestine solidarity organizing, right? So one way to think about this is how organizing around Palestine from 67 and its afterlife is centering Palestinian narratives, centering Palestinian communities in the U.S., and it's against uh, efforts to surveil, efforts to silence that hi history and that archiving. So there's a long sort of history of Arab American student associations as they sought to place these questions at the center of their organizing against colonialism, against U.S. imperial rule, Organizations like the Association of Arab American University Graduates fielded critiques that their work either focused too much on Palestine or not enough on the, on the rest of the Arab world or was not sufficiently focused on identity and rights for Arabs in America. But also these student activists were consistently under attack as they are today from the anti-defamation leagues, infiltration of the Organization of Arab Students, convention to then Congressman Ger Gerald Ford's attack on Arab students as radical agitators and potential terrorists in a speech to the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. What was that? It, this is in the sort of early, like po post 67. Okay. Including, um, so one of the things that, that this archive unearths, right, are all these new, new left flyers likening Palestine to Vietnam, Angola, and material on coalition building between black radicals and Palestinians, and underscoring how these alliances were often, and this is one of the things that the question, that, that the sort of framing question of tonight, um, one way to sort of approach that question is to think about these tensions, right? So one of the things is, t is thinking about the broader Americans left commitment to Palestine that can some, sometimes be somewhat perfunctory or um, uh, framed around slo slogans rather than um, a sort of nuanced historical understanding of the region. Other things that, that I don't have time to sort of go through are some of the, the history of um, heightened government surveillance of and harassment of Arab American students, Arab American organizers, Palestinian students across campuses in the U.S. Um, one of the this sort, well, the sort of effects of these government initiatives fall largely on students facing political Im intimidation meant to suppress their organizing and generate suspicion between and among Arab Americans. The other thing that's important to note in terms of student organizing is um, collaborations with black radical labor activists around predatory housing um, <clears throat> in their neighborhood, and this is in Dearborn, one of the, the sort of arch archival centers of the work, and then in the 70s and 80s, um, ranging from education campaigns to delegations to occupied Palestine and organizing in national um, academic conferences like the NWSA, and we can talk a lot about the histories of Palestine, looking at uh, academic associations to trace histories of the place of Palestine in the U.S. left, and backlash against Palestine activism, um, which is rampant and varied and myriad. Um, another way to think through this is through thinking about the um, coordinated attacks against faculty and students producing scholarship on Palestine. My colleague Amaya Cable calls this compulsory Zionism. And when I teach, you know, since for the past two months, every, every, I'm doing multiple teach-ins per week 
Um, one of the things that I emphasize in every single teaching is the important is the the point that right now is not a time to abandon study, but it's a time to be grounded in Palestinian studies. And so I offer my students a, a Palestinian studies reading list that I'm happy to share with you. Omai Cable's piece on compulsory Zionism is in that reading list. Uh, other p other other um, things that frame this kind of long history of coordinated attacks against faculty and students producing scholarship on Palestine and working in solidarity with Palestinian freedom struggles are works like Miriam Griffin and William Robinson's We Will Not Be Silenced, The Academic Repression of Israel's Critics, and Laura Deeb and Jessica Weiniger's Anthropology's Politics Disciplining the Middle East. And these give you not just histories of left organizing around Palestine, but histories of the suppression of left organizing around Palestine on US campuses. And they trace the history of compulsory Zionism and censorship of scholarship on Palestine in US university settings, and the harassment and intimidation of scholars who center Palestine in their work or activism. This is crucial to, to understand now, right, in terms of centering Palestine, historicizing contemporary Arab American activism, tracing the intersections between the many homes that diasporic activists occupy in their fight against racism with the, in the US and warfare within its imperial reach. As you all know, we are currently witnessing a US-backed Israeli genocidal attack against a dispossessed population in Gaza. <laughs> Escalating state-sponsored settler violence in the West Bank, heightened imprisonment and torture of Palestinians in Israeli prisons, and imprisonment of the state's own citizens who express a modicum of support for Palestinians. Israeli bombs continue to rain down on Gaza, un including estimates of people under the rubble. We're now at 20,000 Palestinians, over 8,000 of them children. A body count that grows every day. They've destroyed hospitals, targeted first responders, murdered journalists, eradicated entire families, leveled neighborhoods, demolished safe routes on which Palestinians were told to flee for their lives, accompanied by Israel's denying Palestinians in Gaza water, medicine, food, electricity, fuel, and telecommunications infrastructure. This is, of course, uh, perpetrated by the world's most one of the world's most powerful militaries against a captive population, nearly half of whom are under 18, at the rate of 3.8 billion US dollars per year, with 66% of constituents, two-thirds of American voters, um, demanding a ceasefire now. So again, this is not a time to abandon study. It's a time to ground ourselves in Palestinian studies as a field. It's a time for reading broadly in Palestinian studies and bringing Palestinian studies into our classrooms. It's a call for educators to follow our colleagues at Birzeit University who have asked for everyone to take seriously the call to, quote, fulfill our intellectual and academic duty of seeking truth, maintaining a critical distance from state-sponsored propaganda, and holding the perpetrators of genocide and those complicit with them accountable. And so now is the time to protect each other as we do this work, to protect staff and faculty and students who speak out about the genocide on Gaza, to rally on campus and behind in support of our students against the anti-Palestinian campaigns in the media and political sphere a time to do this work, right? To remember that discomfort is not danger, to commit to protecting each other under attack, being honest about Israeli state violence, especially in this landscape of hate mail and doxing and censure and censorship and campaigns to get people fired and media blackouts. It's incumbent on us as scholars to protect research and scholarship organ and organizing on Palestine in every corner of our intellectual and political lives. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. And now we'll have CJ. All right. Um, well, in the first place, I think perhaps two humble notes. Firstly, I have no idea why I'm here. I have no expertise whatsoever to speak of on the matter. Um, all I can think is that I think Kevin vaguely likes me, and I suppose I give a token student perspective. Second of all, I think what you've said is, is quite correct and quite important. I've been cautioned by the platypodes not to discuss current events, only to stick to history. Uh, but of course current events are history. Um, there is a genocide ongoing. Uh, uh, the, the Israeli state is perpetrating a genocide. Um, the Palestinian people do and must bestow upon themselves the right uh, to resist it by any means necessary. Um, um, I, I think there can be no equation, no moral or no political or no military equation between the two, the Palestinians and the Israelis. They are not equivalent. One is committing a genocide, one is not. Um, and that's Nothing of substance can be said if we don't acknowledge those facts, and they are facts. That's all I'll say on current events. So, regarding historical considerations of, of the violence in Palestine, shall we say, the modern violence in Palestine, I think how it is conceived of by the left and generally 
revolves around these two schema. Is that the plural of schema? I'm not sure. There are two sets of schema um, for what it can be considered. On the one hand, there is the view that it is accurately described by the sort of Marxist anti-imperialist theory of the war of national liberation. Um, like, as you mentioned, Vietnam, like, I think you said Angola, Mozambique, um, um, Cuba, uh, uh, a nation suppressed by imperialism asserting its national self-determination. And the other viewpoint from which it is understood is the idea that it is a so-called sectarian conflict, that it is a conflict between two religious groups, which is therefore essentially pointless and nonsensical, um, um, and will end only when they both abandon their superstitions. I think you can probably tell by how I describe them which I think is truer. And so I don't think I have time to go through all of it, but I've sketched out here a rough history of, of uh, uh, the violence, the modern violence in Palestine, and why I think one of these views describes it more accurately, accurately than the other. Um, one, one lie you hear is that it's been going on forever, right? There's been this fighting forever. No, no there hasn't. Um, it's been going on since... The, the imperialism of the Ottoman Empire, the sort of proto-imperialism of the Ottoman Empire, was replaced by British imperialism. The Ottoman Empire at least nominally constituted itself as a caliphate, um, not as a nation, but as a, a universal religious authority. And so it explicitly rules its subjects not as a national institution, but as a, 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 an institution endowed by God in a kind of pre-modern political framework. Um, and because of this, the revolts of Arab peoples during and before World War I, and subsequently uh, uh, the taking over of Palestine by the British, first as a military administration and then as a League of Nations mandate colony, quite explicitly were framed as, um, we are not a religious group, we are national. Um, Turks and Arabs, we might both be Muslims, but Arabs are in fact a nation. And the, you know, these Turkic sultans can't say they're in charge of us just because we're both Muslims. No, no, no. We are a nation. The Arab revolt founds itself on that idea. And in the same way, at least nominally, the purpose of a League of Nations mandate is to prepare a territory for self-governance. So explicitly, the rendering of Palestine as a League of Nations mandate is to say this is a nation which exists. It is the you know, of course, this isn't actually what the imperialist powers wanted, but this is what they said. It is the duty of, of the, the occupying power, the British, to prepare this nation to be sovereign. Except that the British, right before they take it as a, as a mandate, you know, take the, the Balfour Declaration and say, we're not going to prepare it to be sovereign for the people who actually live there. We're going to prepare it to be sovereign for our own Jews, because we want to get rid of them. Um, it was essentially the, the essence of it. And so the resistance to that, once again, is not framed as an Islamic resistance to Judaism. It is framed as, a, as a, um, an Arab national resistance. The first documented Palestinian self-determination groups are the Muslim Christian associations, right? The very name indicates that this is a secular, multi-religious grouping. Um, the 1936 to 38 revolt was not led by any kind of Islamist formulation. It was led by Arab nationalist formulations. Um, um, in 1948, there were some Islamic fighters. There was a, a group that called themselves the Holy War Army. So obviously, that you know is a is a tacit signal to to you know jihad perhaps or or to I suppose to a crusade. I don't know if they were Muslims or Christians. I don't. That's not, that's not important. Um, but the vast majority of, of the motivation here is, is pan-Arab. It is this idea that there is an Arab nation, um, or a Palestinian nation, or some combination of the two. Uh, once again, the Six-Day War and the Yom Kippur War, who do we see most enthusiastically supporting the Palestinians? Not fanatical Islamists. Um, people like the Egyptians, right? Pan-Arabist. Uh, uh, governments. Now, now, do I think the Egyptian government was, was great and wonderful and progressive? No, not really. But it's, it's, it's erroneous to frame this as a sectarian war because quite explicitly they were fighting on the basis of liberation of a nation. Um, so then the PLO was founded in 1964, the PFLP in 1967, uh, the Democratic Popular, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine in 67, Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine in 68. These kinds of sec explicitly secular, explicitly Republican, explicitly vaguely left-wing um, fighting organizations define Palestinian resistance for the next several decades. Uh, uh, and throughout sort of the 60s to 80s, 
as the Soviet Union, which had always sort of bizarrely, it had always vacillated on the Palestine question, and maybe we, we'd like Zionism, or maybe we don't, and we'd, we'd rather the Jews, you know, resettle in, a, in a, a communal structure which we've set up in Siberia, but they don't want to do that, because um, Siberia is cold, um, and so on and so forth. As the Soviet Union stops being the world leader of the left, and there start being these new, more radical communist formulations, we see outpouring of international solidarity for Palestine, especially for the PFLP, um, from Japan, from Colombia, from the Americas, once again, not from Islamists, but from Marxists, who especially are in solidarity with the PFLP, uh, uh, and are concerned with this idea of national liberation, this idea that either there are two nations in conflict which must, res must resolve this conflict, or there is one nation and there is a colonial project. Um, so again, not, sect not sectarian violence. It's only really... Okay. My point is, in the long term, um, it's a very recent development that this has been rendered as a sectarian conflict, as a supposed endless war that has gone on forever and will go on forever between Jews and Muslims, and it's basically stupid. Um, and I think that has led to, to a lack of imagination and a lack of belief in the people that actually live in Palestine to be able to pursue freedom. Um, um, notably, because the, the prompt asks about what is possible, I want to kind of query the, the dogma of the so-called two-state solution. The idea that because there are these two sectarian groups that fundamentally hate each other, the only possible way for there to be peace is a massive wall between them and for them both to live in, in states fundamentally defined on ethnic and religious lines. I think that displays a profound lack of imagination and also a sort of infantilization of the people that actually live in Palestine on either side of the wall. Um, you know, they're not fighting because they're stupid or ignorant or hateful in some intrinsic way that other people aren't. They're fighting because of material circumstances. Remove the material circumstances. Arabs and, and Jews are both perfectly capable of living in a secular, democratic, free society. And that is the only genuine hope for, for, for peace, I think, which is what has been proposed always by the Palestinian left, by their international comrades, is one democratic, secular, united, and independent republic in Palestine, which is not founded on this myth of perpetual you know, sectarian and racial war, but is actually founded on a nation of people have material problems and we must fix them. Um, yeah, I wrote rather more notes than I meant to, but that's, oh, that's, 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 that's my thesis, That's good, CJ. Thank you, CJ. And, um, yeah, now, uh, David. Yeah. No expert, my ass. <laughs> that's pretty good. Um, uh, so I'm not going to talk about Gaza um, because everybody else is talking about Gaza, including cousins I've never seen and people like that. So um, I grew up as a secular Jew in, in New York City. My parents were communists. We, if you read the book by Irving Howe called World of Our Fathers, it describes the New York working class Jewish thing um, that many people became, begat, and eventually morphed now, and unfortunately in a certain way, in a big way, into what you call the Liberal Democratic Party in New York. Um, but that's sort of like the basis of it. My mom, to give you an idea where this discussion is going to go from, my, from me, my mother, who died about 10 years ago, when she was 16 in 1936, went on a train to Milwaukee, and sitting next to her was Golda Meir, the former Prime Minister of Israel, who were setting up and expanding the labor Zionist um, uh, movement in the United States, um, which was actually an international movement. Among Jewish Americans and among Jews everywhere, nobody gave a shit because American Jews were not Zionists. And this is one of the mythologies that you'll get from the Jewish establishment, especially Israel, but especially in the United States, also in the United States, that there's this intrinsic thing because, you know, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, Moses, which most Jews don't give a shit about the, about the Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. They do not care. They don't care what Moses said in Exodus. They don't care about what was written there. This was a neo-colonial project, the Zionist movement, from day one. And the, the, the beginning salient date is when the Dreyfus Affair occurred in France, and Theodor Herzl, a British Jewish, I think he was actually German, um, 
uh, activist was taken aback and decided we need to have a Jewish homeland. And this is the start of what we call, what I would call bourgeois Zionism. But within a few years, it found a footing among some Jewish working class activists exclusively in Europe and in the United States. I, I, I want to emphasize that because half the Jews in the world don't come, don't look like me. They look like Yasser Arafat or they look like Arabs because they are Arabs, basically. They're from North Africa, they're from Iraq, they're from different countries in Asia. Um, and, you know, my upbringing, this proletarian upbringing that I had, uh, that was steeped in Marxism and civil rights and unions and stuff, uh, was an outgrowth of the impoverished Jewish working class in Eastern Europe, whose families came to the United States largely around 1903, which was one of the large pogroms, uh, massacres of Jews by the Tsarist government, which owned Poland at that time. And a million people immigrated, about two million people immigrated, if I'm not mistaken, before 19. 20 um, to the United States. These Jews were Yiddish speaking, they were from peasant society, shtetls we call them in Yiddish, little villages throughout Poland and the palace settlement in Belarus and in Russia and Ukraine. And they were terribly oppressed. They came to the United States, became workers. They were all to a person a socialist. They joined the Socialist Party. Um, in Eastern Europe they were members of something called the Jewish Socialist Bund. Um, and the Jewish Socialist Bund was an interesting organization because it was anti-Zionist. It was a Jewish nationalist group, but it didn't look for a Jewish homeland. They wanted cultural autonomy, they wanted Yiddish to be accepted by the state governments for Jews to speak, and they tried to organize that within the Socialist International. So the Socialist Movement in the United States, which had a big, strong Jewish influence, the far right is right about that, there was a lot of Jewish Bolsheviks, um, were, were in fact um, anti-Zionist. The American Jewish Committee, which is an ongoing group today, was anti-Zionist before World War II. So from 1898 or 1892 through the end of World War II, most Jews thought that Zionism was a utopian scheme. And they considered them to be a little bit nutty. My mother once described the way she was looked at by other people in her family as sort of like the way people look at Mormons today, secular people look at Mormons, you know, kind of like, kind of like way out there, theologically speaking. That's how Zionists were viewed. So the, the history of Zionism for Americans, for North Americans, where it grabbed on to most American Jews, came about in large part because, of, because the only reason is because of the Holocaust and the murder of Jews by the Nazis. And that gave the Zionist organizations who had a lot of money, um, whether they were socialist Zionist groups, which I think is an oxymoron, but um, the traditional basic patriotic Jewish organizations in the United States, a huge leeway in using the moral outrage of what Hitler did, the Nazis did to the Jews in Eastern Europe, as more and more of it came to light, as a way to push for Zionism and the Jewish homeland. Israel, as such, wasn't used as a term so much, but it was the Jewish homeland. So the Socialist Party and the Communist Parties, which were the two biggest parties on the, on the left, which is sort of like what the question says, they didn't even deal with Zionism. It, it wasn't even like a thing, except the occasional polemic against them. I was looking through issues. We put up the Daily Worker online from 1924 through 1940, and I, could, I found very little polemics against Zionism. But it was there, but it wasn't that much. The Jewish question was a big question. How do we solve the Jewish question? And they took the position of, uh, in a way of the boon. We have to end capitalist society because it's capitalism and wars that breed anti-Semitism. Um, and there is a lot of literature out there that you can read you know, on this question. But in terms of the left and the unions, um, nobody was running until the end of World War II toward Zionism, either in the union movement as a whole, or among Jewish Americans. At that point, 1946, everything started to change, and Zionism became a dominant political stream. In my family, you could not, at Passover or whatever, you could not raise a criticism of Israel. Like, I don't think the weather, you're a self-hating Jew. That's what you would get. This is 1969, I'm talking about, when I was a kid. You couldn't raise these questions. People were so wedded emotionally, American Jews, of my dad's generation, my parents' generation, the greatest generation, those people. Um, 
all my aunts and uncles, they were all in World War II. You know, everybody joined up and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the war, they became Zionists. My parents joined the Communist Party in 1945 because they were better builders of the Jewish homeland than the Zionist movement was. My mom quit the Habonim, joined the CP, because Stalin and the Soviet Union were arming Haganah, which was one of the left-wing uh, militias, the biggest militia that became the IDF. And um, they ran guns for Haganah out of Czechoslovakia, uh, organized by the Czechoslovak Communist Party. There's a lot of reasons for this, a lot of which was the influence of the communists among Jews, both in Israel, but also in the West. And they wanted to... Uh, Let me finish. Oh, that's yeah. going up? Okay. Um, and so th this is how sort of like Zionism became such a thing in the United States, and it was because of World War II. Um, just lastly, um, Jennifer and also uh, CJ mentioned that 1967 is a salient year. It was a six-day war. It put Israel on the map for everybody when they beat the three armies of, actually it was four, because it didn't include Iraq. And um, ever since then, the PLO became active. We now had the drift of, the, under the influence of the civil rights movement and the new left and the Vietnam War movement, to start criticizing Israel. And that's how I became radicalized, even though my mom was a, was a very, very strong Zionist. So, that's it. All right, uh, thank you, David. And now we'll have, last but not least, Alex. Yeah, so we mentioned um, the Second International a couple times here, and um, <clears throat> or the International in general, the Communist International. Um, that's very interesting what you said. I didn't know that 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 the that Stalin, you know, was so critical at uh, founding uh, Israel. I had heard it before, but. Um, yeah, basically, you know, I mean, I, I've studied, you know, the Second International quite quite a lot. And, I mean, nowadays, so what is the Second International? The Second International was the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the combined socialist parties of the world um, that, you know, would meet annually and, and had, you know, media running and so on and, and had congresses in which um, resolutions were passed. And it was an international workers' movement, and out of that, you know, I mean, uh, there were many debates within the Second International uh, that are critical, kind of, you know, to everything we've talked about here, that became critical. Um, in the Second International, um, one of the most heated topics of debate was the question of how socialists in, around the world should relate to colonialism. And uh, on the one side, you had people like, uh, on the right wing of the social democratic parties of the world, you had right wing people like um, Edward Bernstein, who were, you know, not in favor of colonialism, but they were more so, uh, they were more so, they considered themselves positivists. They wanted to improve the working conditions and, and, and the conditions of people that were being colonized by Europe. And then you had the negativists, which, you know, ended up being a majority numerically at the end. I mean, there were a lot of splits after World War I, but the negativists of colonialism um, were, you know, against colonialism and, and were, you know, actively um, fighting their governments from, um, you know, colonizing and exploiting people around the world. Um, so, I mean, nowadays we don't have an international workers' movement the way that we used to have, you know. The Soviet Union is gone. CJ mentioned that earlier. Um, and the Soviet Union used to be regarded as like a, a you know a, a great ally of colonized peoples, and um, you know that's more or less true, at least in the case of Vietnam, uh, where you know weapons were given to the Vietnamese. You know, the Soviet soldiers actually went there and you know were winning dogfights against the Americans for many months at the beginning of the war. But um, you know nowadays we have very different conditions um, with regards to um, you know you know, the, the struggle of Palestinians. I and mean, it's hard watching the news, uh, seeing all this happen, and, and not really being able to do much about it. Um, we do have, you know, many different movements in the United States which are actively organizing protests against the war. Um, but, you know, um, when, I, when I see a, a moment like this where, you know, Palestinians are rising up um, uh, against uh, the state of Israel, the apartheid state of Israel, um, 
uh, I think it's a moment like, you know, it's a bitter, I, I don't want to say it's a bittersweet moment, but it kind of is because it's a, it's a kind of hope, you know, when, a, when exploited oppressed peoples rise up like that, it's a kind of hope that should be seized internationally um, to, to, to aid in, uh, uh, you know, getting rid of oppression, getting rid of colonialism. Um, one person that I've read quite a bit about who's an Israeli uh, socialist, his name is uh, Moshe Makover. He was one of the founders of Matzpen, I believe the 1960s, maybe a little earlier even, um, but I believe it's the 1960s. He, uh, he was an Israeli Jew, is an Israeli Jew who lives in uh, the United Kingdom now. He's been expelled uh, repeatedly from the Labour Party in the United Kingdom for his views on, you know, Zionism. He's an anti-Zionist uh, communist. And um, Moshe, you know, kind of, you know, he, he created a lot, of, a lot of controversy in Israel in the 60s and 70s with Mats Penn because they, um, they tried to organize um, Arab and Jewish workers to um, unite against, you know, the Zionist project, the, the apartheid system. In, in, um, in, in Israel. Um, and, you know, unfortunately that project failed, like a lot of leftist projects have historically. But uh, it's something that I think is inevitable. If, if there's going to be a change in Israel, it's not going to come about, in my opinion, through military means. Although I'm not going to condemn, you know, military actions of oppressed people because it give, you know, brings attention uh, to the problem. Um, but the fact that Palestine hardly exists anymore nowadays. Uh, that, that the West Bank is completely colonized and, and is being, you know, the Palestinians are being removed, uh, jailed by the tens of thousands, as we're seeing in the news, you know, Hamas uh, and the Palestinian authorities are, are exchanging one uh, Palestinian uh, prisoner for, you know, or one, one Jewish uh, prisoner of war for a thousand uh, Palestinian prisoners. You've got a few more minutes. Okay, yeah. cool. So, you know, um, I think the relationship between Israel and the United States and, and the West is kind of important to, to go into, uh, which is that um, why, why do we have this project Israel um, and why does it still, I mean it's one of the few, few, you know, actual, um, not exploitative, but expropriative colonial projects in the world right now that's brazenly just taking land and, and, and kicking people off the land, not just, you know, uh, it, it's similar to what the United States did to Native Americans in this country, uh, kicking people off their land and using it instead of, you know, going there and, and like a lot of European colonial projects historically did, uh, using the Native population as labor and so on, you know, um, trying to civilize India or whatever. Um, so the relationship between Israel and the United States is critical to the entire Western world uh, because um, I think there's a clip of Biden I saw recently where he says, um, if, if we didn't have an Israel, we would have to go out and invent one because, you know, Israel is a, uh, a military power in the Middle East that is, um, that is proven militarily that it can kick the asses of the armies uh, that, that are bordering it. Um, and, and, you know, the United States votes every time with Israel against any condemnation of the vast majority of the world's countries, um, you know, condemning uh, its apartheid and its oppression of Palestinians and its human rights abuses. So, um, yeah, I could talk on a little bit more, or? Uh, if, if, yeah, that's good. I mean, if okay. you want to say anything uh, was about the um, sort of diminishing threshold of leftist imagination, I thought that oh, yeah. you curious about that, mm. give about a minute, minute left. Mm, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, we don't have an international, I think, you know, we don't have an international workers' movement, we don't have a strong workers' movement in this country either, um, although there are, there's hope, you know, I mean, there's more, more and more union struggles in the country going on, um, but, um, yeah, I mean, my personal opinion is, you know, you need, you need an international movement, you need to have way more discourse on the left, um, such as this, you know, all around the country, and on a bigger forum, on bigger forum. And um, you need to kind of develop a kind of sense of, of common goals, you know, uh, around which to organize, around which to, to, to actually try to intervene, uh, to, to come to the aid and, uh, and help, you know, colonized peoples like uh, the Palestinians fight for the freedom. Okay, uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, that concludes the opening remarks. And 
Uh, now we're going to have yeah two or three minutes for the panelists to respond to each other, uh, starting uh, in order of uh, first uh, appearance. So Jennifer. Um. Yeah. So I a couple. I guess I'll just sort of respond to to each of you. Um, one of the things um, that I appreciated uh, around what you what you pointed to at the end of of your talk is the um, importance of the um, insistence on being able to imagine um, more broadly and more capaciously than the than what is offered to us, right? Than what is on offer. So one of the things, um, one of the chapters in my book, my book is about solidarity tourism to occupied Palestine. So it's about the process since the first intifada of um, inviting internationals to come to Palestine. Uh, to learn more about the effects of Israeli state violence on Palestinian land and lives. And one of the chapters is about the work of anti-Zionist Israeli organizations inside Israel's 48 borders working with um, West Bank Palestinian organizations to imagine a future post the realization of the right of return. So post when Palestinian refugees can return to their former homes, of which many of them have the keys, right, to their initial homes that they were kicked out of in before, during, after 1948. Um, and part of that labor is imagining, for example, what a um, university space would look like, what a what the village would look like, talking to refugees from that village and thinking like how do you want to, where will this like flower bank go, where will this this fountain go, where will this apartment complex go, how will we live in this space and I think the insistence on the capacity to imagine that is something that Palestinian, and this is again why we need to be grounded in Palestinian studies because it's something that Palestinian scholars have long um, articulated not only in the historical record of displacement but also in the insistence on what is possible and so to hold on to that and then another part of of the um, book deals with virtual tours in Gaza and one of the virtual tourism projects in Gaza was a collaboration between an Indiana University um, college class and a, and a university college class in Gaza where students identified 250 sites of relevance and talked about what it would what a Gaza 2050 would look like post liberation what a Gaza 2050 would look like if it were allowed to embrace those sites of historic importance what a Gaza 2050 would look like if all those 250 sites were preserved and if there were freedom of movement from Gaza City to Jerusalem and freedom of movement from Jerusalem to Bethlehem and what it, what it would look like post liberation and I think Right now, that's devastating, not only because Israel has decimated every um, university in Gaza, but also what's important, I think, to follow up on this question of hope is to insist that that is possible, insist that Palestine will be free, insist that there will be a moment when we will be able to talk about freedom of mobility and the sort of right to something like hosting tourists in a, in a place like Gaza, in Gaza and specifically. Um, the other, the th what I want to uh, highlight from your talk is the importance of knowing that, the importance of debunking the idea that Zionism is a default Jewish position, right? And, and the importance of, ta of the insistence that since Zionism there has been Jewish anti-Zionism, right? And, and that it isn't, the, it isn't what the U.S. Resolution 894 is trying to make it, right? That anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And so tracing that history and being able to describe that history contextualizes things like the complete takeover of Grand Central, right, of Jewish American anti-Zionist activists right now. The, compl the complete um, full-throated insistence that anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism, on the part of Jewish American activists saying, not in my name, occupying the federal buildings, occupying Grand Central, right? The way that this is like covered on democracy now, but not in mainstream news sources, right? And how that is orchestrated to manufacture an idea that criticism of Israel and anti-Zionism are tantamount to anti-Semitism. And so to debunk that, I think, not only historically and on panels like this, but actually in all of your conversations with everyone around you is is such important work. And I and I think that gets to your lot like point 
which is the question about like helplessness right now. And I think it does sometimes feel like there is nothing you can do, but actually there's so much, right? There's so much that you can do. And it, and it, and it ranges from big to small, right? It ranges from calling your representatives as part of your daily morning routine to talking to, to having uncomfortable conversations to like being willing to experience discomfort in the service of insisting on truth and of insisting on historical accuracy of insisting on the right of everyone to live freely and move freely and have food and have water right these kind of principles that that um that do not get to be like partitioned out based on who is deserving and undeserving right, right. so um yeah so that's my responses to you all thank you all right thanks and uh cj well no one said anything i disagree with really so i can sort of pleasantly respond uh by rehashing things i i agree with which is much more fun um you bring up and i i, I it relates to something i was talking about i think before we started filming uh, uh again how important it is that the people of the world, and above all the people of Palestine, are capable of imagining a genuine, free, and democratic society in Palestine. They are, they are capable, as much as anyone, more so than anyone, because it's their damn country, um, of breaking out of this thought trap that the only future is either total extermination or a perpetual continuation of sectarian and ethnic divisions, um, more walls, you know, a division into these ridiculous, non-contiguous, you know, gerrymandered, nonsense-shaped, pseudo-country Bantu stands. Um, no, it's possible to imagine a genuine democratic society. A anyway, you mention um, university spaces. Imagining, you know, we can rebuild these, or not we, they can rebuild these university spaces that have been destroyed. Um, the thing coming out of Gaza right now that I saw, which upset me most, perhaps bizarrely, perhaps because I love books, that upset me more than, than, than the, the horrific direct blood we've seen was a, a, a video from an Israeli news channel of a university library that had been destroyed. And they're filming this pile of, of you know, burnt out books um, in this library. And one of them is a book about the Nazis. It's not actually clear if it's pro or anti-Nazi, because I don't read Arabic, but it has a picture of Hitler on the front. And, and they say, well, look, this university is training Nazis and terrorists, so it's good that we did this. And I think to myself, well, God, I'm pretty sure my university library has books on the Nazis. I think probably this library even has pro-Nazi books, because it's quite normal for intellectuals to study opposing positions in order to learn why they're wrong. I don't know. I haven't checked. I would guess we have a copy of Mein Kampf, um, which I guess means it's okay for the IDF to bomb us. And I thought, the more I stewed over this video, the more angry and the more frightened I got, because what they're trying to do is to rob this nation of people of the ability to produce its own intellectuals and its own historians and its own people that can tell it the story of its existence, that can produce ideas, that can teach it the essence of its existence. And this is why they are destroying the hospitals and the, the schools and the libraries and the universities, is to rob a people of their ability to learn and imagine. And that is, I think, as existentially frightening as is murder, although certainly the murder is the more imminent problem. Um, so yes, it, you know, I think it's very important that we keep thinking about imagining. And relating to what, to what you've said, I'm sorry, I'm terrible with names, David. relating to what you've said and what, what, what the both of you have said, um, what David has said and what, and what uh, Alex. Alex has said. Um, <laughs> I thought I was it's very important. Obviously, we want to center, I think, first of all, the Palestinians. You always want to center the people who are, who are fighting the struggle against their oppression. But it's also important that the global Jewish population be encouraged and allowed and not punished. Oh. You just finish your thought. Well, for learning that there are and there have always been political currents for them beyond Zionism and in the global left movement, which has existed and could exist again. It is a lie, and in fact, I think it's a profoundly anti-Semitic lie, that the only political consciousness Jews can have is one built on the extermination of another people. No. Uh, uh, Jews are able and Palestinians are able to imagine living in peace in a democratic global society. Um, and that's what we must aspire to. All right. Thanks, CJ. And uh, now, David. So, yeah, debunking is like, I feel like it's been my life since I, I was a kid. I, I went to Israel when I was 13 instead of getting a bar mitzvah. I went to Israel to see the cousins. 
and went to Afakim in the underneath the Jordanian side of the Golanites. Rockets, whoosh, Russian made Katusha rockets, hitting our kibbutz. It was August of 1970. In September of 1970 was Black September. It's when King Hussein, at the behest of the Israeli government, even though they didn't have diplomatic relations, and the United States crushed the Palestinian movement. It's how they all ended up in Lebanon, <coughs> which some of us know more about um, because of that civil war. Uh, but, you know, I went there and I, when, at 13 years old, I had wage labor and capital, reading it on the air, LL airplane on the way in, civil rights movement, 1967, right? So, can Arabs join the kibbutz? Oh, no. We wouldn't want that. So, it's the latent, it's the latent racism of left-wing, of left-wing Israelis that killed me. Um, the Other Israel is the name of the book on the history of the Israeli Socialist Organization. The book that Machover, uh, the organization that Machover was a member of, 1965 is what I'm thinking, is the date when it was founded. They were severely repressed, not killed. Um, one of my friends, Tifka, uh, was in the Palmach, the Israeli Zionist commandos, and became an ardent, when she was 16, and became an ardent anti-Zionist and was one of the founders also of Matzapen. It's the name of their, it means compass in, uh, in, uh, Hebrew, I think it is. Anyway, um, and that's the Masapen organization. And there's always been an anti-Zionist organization among Israeli Jews. Another great book is The Great Game by Leonard Trepper. Leonard Trepper was the head of the Red Orchestra in Nazi Germany who spied for the Russian, uh, for the Soviet military secret police on the Nazis. And they were the ones who warned Stalin, didn't listen, that the Russians were going to invade in September of, 1930, of 1941. <coughs> And he was first a communist in 1921 in Palestine. And he actually was so demoralized that he left. So it, it's, it's never really been a good thing to be an anti-Zionist in Palestine uh, for a variety of reasons, whether you're a Jew or whether you're an Arab. Um, you know, I totally agree. The democratic, sectional, se democratic secular Palestine, I have to read it, is what I grew up with as being the imagining what it would be like not a binational state. You know what a binational state is? Lebanon. How'd that work out? You'd have Shia, you know, you have Muslims, you have a, Christians, they have a certain amount of people. That's what a binational state is. It's actually one state, but evenly divided in certain areas and stuff. And then there's the, the nonsense about a socialist Israel next to a socialist Palestine. Well, Israel's still a racist apartheid state, whether you want to call it socialist or not, if it's based on a religion. That's the admittance to Israel. It's not your nationality. It's your religion. And so that's why Ethiopian Jews, who I'm sure I have some cultural similarities with, and Yemenite Jews and Moroccan Jews and the Ashkenazi European Jews, it, the whole Jewish people thing is a myth. It took me a long time to come around to that idea, but it, but it really is, it is sort of true. First of all, the other thing that is really dangerous with the repression, it, it used to be when Pollock, this guy who worked at the Pentagon, American, Jewish American, ended up being a spy for Israel. And... Israel plays into this thing that your first loyalty is to Israel. For better or for worse, I was born here. I'm an American, Jewish hyphenated American, and just like all of us are. And, um, and, or you become, or your children certainly are, for better or for worse. Um, and it's, yeah, I, I keep going back to that thing about Israel and Jews. And it just keeps me so. All right, well, thanks, um, David, and uh, now Alexander to respond to any of your fellow panelists uh, with the prompt or what they've said. Um, sure, yeah. I mean, uh, I feel like I learned a lot from you guys here already. Um, I'll just harp on again, you know, about the, the concept of national liberation. Um, I think, you know, uh, the reason why I, I kind of opened with the, um, the focus on the theory of the Second International, um, colonial policy versus anti-colonial policy, or, you know, reform versus revolution and the, and the question of colonial policy um, is because it was actually very relevant because in 1917 um, and in that whole period, the three years after, there were many revolutions all throughout Europe, uh, Asia, um, which, you know, overthrew colonial uh, powers uh, that were governing them. And uh, that was, you know, um, that was done on the backs of, you know, decades and generations of organizers who um, were organizing to have um, mass parties and uh, who organized through internationals. 
uh, through second, third internationals. And so, you know, um, it's just, you know, another example, in my opinion, why, um, why theory is actually very relevant and um, that it can eventually actually have a real impact on the world. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Alex. Um, we're going to open the floor to questions now, and uh, I'll, as moderator, will, uh, I'm going to take my uh, privilege as moderator to ask the first question uh, to you guys. It's, uh, it's addressed to everybody. But um, we've talked about the sort of imaginings for the future of Palestine, um, you know, Pal a Palestinian Israeli state. And you know, in the prompt, there's this question about how the imagination of leftists today might fall below the threshold of previous epochs of the left, whether it be like PLO, like Pan-Arab nationalism, um, or like Matspen, or people who are trying to, you know, uh, sort of advance their, their societies. Um, how does the current sort of response, of which there is a lot of you know, street demonstrations and public uh, emotion, uh, fit into this sort of imagination of what role the left is going to play in um, putting an end to the violence in the region and the establishment of a sort of global society uh, for people there to participate in. Because there's, there's certainly a lot of sentiment and you know emotion, and for, but it's, it's ambivalent and confusing to me what, where it actually points to, right? Where does the violence point to, where does attention being garnered towards the issue actually point towards to, uh, what is it actually going to produce? So that's uh, addressed to uh, anyone who would like to respond. Yeah, David? No, I, have, I haven't talked about Gaza or Palestine today um, because I figured everybody else was going to talk about that and some people did. So, um, so I, I've been in touch with Israeli Trotskyists and Maoists um, off and on for 30 years. Um, that's the, the Matzah Pen organization is kind of Trotskyist, just to put it on the spectrum of organizations. There's also uh, an Israeli Arab Communist Party, too, which we shouldn't overlook, which plays a bigger role now than certainly the remnants of Matzah Pen did. And, you know, in all the discussion, they all hold the same kind of position that we've articulated here about defending the right of oppressed people to. A rebel. But it's not true for them that they have a carte blanche. That is, you know, Palestinian communists, the few that there are. But the groups that they're actually the DFLP, for instance, in Gaza has a mass membership there. It's just a lot smaller than that. Um, and, uh, you know, they've understood. I've talked to their leaders 30 years ago when I was in New York. And um, and, you know, they understand that this is a very important question from a military point of view, not just the military, the IDF, but the fact is the Palestinians represent a slight majority over the 7 million Israelis that are there. And the real problem is, is that the biggest working class center in, the, in that region is in Tel Aviv. And they're, ma they're, they're, all, they're mostly Jewish. Um, and uh, CJ or maybe perhaps Jennifer was right when they said, one of you said about the apartheid nature of the regime, um, it's true apartheid in Israel. Unlike South Africa, which was the petty apartheid and social apartheid, everything about racist South Africa, 100% of it was based on the exploitation of black labor. They could not do without it. Israel has taken that to a much different conclusion, 180 degrees. They don't want to, they do not want to exploit Arab labor. The Histrojude and the labor Zionists in the 1930s, Histrojude is the Union of Hebrew Workers in Palestine, and it's still a union today, much reduced, existed so that owners of Jewish factories would fire their Arab workers and hire only Jewish workers. This is not a legacy anybody who was raised in this country thinks is a good idea, especially progressive Jews who, by default, support Israel. And you know, debunking again, I can't get away from it, but the imagination is how to get to the democratic secular Palestine from now to there. And it's a hard question. I said there's 7 million Israelis. Most of the oppressed majority 
don't live inside the political entity that they're trying to take. They're on the outside. This is unique. I can't think of anything else that's close to that in history. In the workers' movement, how to deal with the questions of national liberation. I'm a Leninist. I support, well, I support Eric Bloch's understanding of Leninism, which is well, of self-determination, which means really the right of agency to decide for yourself how to proceed and liberate yourself. But to do that, in my opinion, in the opinion of communists I've talked to and to um, groups in, the, in Gaza, but also in, uh, in Israel and other places, you have to win over a, a minority of the oppressor nationality in order to do this. I wouldn't say that about South Africa. Who gave a shit what white people's <coughs> opinions were? None of them were working class. It was a small Afrikaner working class, but it was not relevant. In Israel, it's a really tough situation. Mm. So, you, so in an, uh, an article in this World Outlook, Peter Seidman, a staunch anti-science, said, look, does Hamas's actions on October 7th, this is the nitty-gritty of the thing, does it help or hinder that motion toward national liberation? Now, I can make the cases that it does. I can say that it mobilized the Arab street all over the Middle East, all, in, all over the Middle East and North Africa and Europe, a real positive thing, but I can't say that, that my cousins won't talk to me now. Dafna, Rit, you know, Yaniv, my son knows who they are, um, because of my position on defending Palestine. But they were very open to all these kind of things until October 7th. So you have to look at this when you, when you defend the regime, you defend the right of oppressed to rebel. You also have to look, if you were a communist, a communist if you were a, a national liberation fighter and you want to see this dream, this imagination come to f fruition, how do we get there when 7 million people now really hate your guts? They believe everything. You know, even the nonsense about the babies being bad and all that. It's a, it's a tough question. I do not have an answer for you. I'll be honest with you. I don't have that answer. Is there anybody else on the panel, one of the press? CJ? So, uh, modern imagination. I think I've been sort of vaguely present in the, in the international left response to the current genocide. I was in San Francisco uh, when I believe it was, they said, 40,000 people were marching down What's It Street, um, led by the PYM. Uh, uh, I think, again, you know, I've tried to emphasize this difference between understanding a war of national liberation as something that can be won and can conclude injustice as compared to a sectarian conflict, which is something that, first of all, doesn't really exist, and second of all, is necessarily perpetual and unwinnable and unlosable and has no right side and has no wrong side. Um, I think the international left is breaking out of that, even Jewish people I know. A lot of them, in fact, um, and is kind of coming around to this this um, idea of national liberation, to this idea of of something other than the continual perpetuation of a supposed racial and religious uh, uh, stalemate um, or complete extermination, as the case may be. There's increasingly the concept you hear is not the phrase national liberation, but the phrase decolonization which in practice, I think, comes with a lot of the same meaning, and certainly pe most people that would support the one support the other. Slightly different philosophical forebears, right? People are talking more and more about Franz Fanon. Um, wonderful thinker, absolutely applicable to the Palestinian situation. Um, I do think, though, the concept of decolonization, although this isn't actually in the work of great philosophers like Fanon, it comes with this kind of baggage about the concept of indigeneity, Mm -hmm. and these perpetual debates about who is indigenous, who is not indigenous. It, first of all, is there a Jewish nation? Second of all, is it indigenous? Is anybody indigenous? You know, Are they both indigenous? Is neither indigenous? Are they maybe both secretly the same people? Um, I think that's a dead end, politically. I think we should stop debating who was there first, um, because it, 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 in the end it's an idealism, it's a reification of a, of a memory of something no one remembers. Um, nobody knows who was there first, probably not someone who would have recognized either the concept of, of Arab or the concept of Jew, right? Probably a Canaanite, and that's not what they called themselves, so what, what the hell is the point of who was an indigenous? I think you should analyze it as a material situation where you have an oppressor and an oppressed, um, and maybe forget for a second about, oh, who was there first? I don't really care. Um, uh, 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 I also think, on the subject of imagining democratic secular Palestine, I think a lot of people when you say that, we'll ask the question, well, that's all well and good, 
but you can't deny that if the Israeli government collapses today, um, the largest and most powerful Palestinian political movement is Hamas, which is Maybe they might say they are in some sense democratic, but I think a lot of people would disagree, and certainly they would not be, be considered secular. Um, I think it's, in relation to that, it's worth stating, first of all, yes, it's true. Hamas is, is at least in Gaza, the largest and most powerful Palestinian political group. Um, but it is not ubiquitous and unopposed in the way Israeli media has, has put a lot of money into making us think, right? There's a... There's a, a like the Wikipedia article for the current violence says 2023 Israel Gaza or Israel Hamas war, which is just factually inaccurate. There are, there are secularists and Democrats and communists who are also fighting. They're smaller groups, but they're not necessarily tiny. Actually, the DFLP is is it's big. big. Um, second of all, nearly every response, nearly every proposal of of um, decolonization of Palestine that you will hear in the Palestinian left. First of all, it doesn't involve, let's kick out all the Jews and make them go home. You know, I've, I've seen it happen. If you go into Palestinian political organizing spaces among the Palestinian diaspora and you start saying that shit, they go, please shut up. You know, we're not, that's not what we're about. Um, no, nobody's interested in your sort of political role play of, of making all the Jews go back to Germany. Nobody actually wants that. Um, and then second of all, uh, overwhelmingly demands for decolonization involve the idea of the diaspora going home. Um, you know, they were evicted unwillingly. Many of them still have the keys to their houses. They know their addresses. Before they were evicted, they were an overwhelmingly peasant people, which means they had a very close and intimate connection to the farmlands of the villages where they lived. So there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of Palestinian clans and families around the world that want to go home. And they have all kinds of diverse political beliefs, right? They're in the PYM, they're in the PPP. All these Palestinian political organizations which aren't in Palestine, but have a reach within the Arab world and the Palestinian diaspora and intend to go home. And I think when we see them all go home, that is when we will see this really big flowering of diverse ideas about what a democratic secular Palestine could look like. And will there be bloodshed? Will there be struggle? Oh, absolutely. But isn't there already? Um, uh, audience, anyone have a question they'd like to ask any panelists? Uh, Patrick? All right, so my question is uh, kind of about, like, you know, how did the kind of Arab nationalists, and especially during the PLO era, which, like, or explicitly socialist, you know, because Fatah's, I think, a member of the Second International, and the DFLP and PFLP are, uh, well, I know that we, we might not think the Second National Socialists anymore, but whatever. But, like, the DFLP and PFLP are both you know, Marxist, Leninist, to an extent, Maoist or something. So, like, how come that was, like, the like the leading force, you know, like, meeting with Bill Clinton and the Israeli Prime Minister and stuff, like, trying to hash things out, and now it's, like, uh, how did Hamas or Islamism more generally kind of take over? And I know in, like, the West Bank, Fatah is, like, still in power, um, but, you know, kind of similar to Hamas, uh, they are not very popular as a political organization. It seems like Palestinians don't really like anyone who rules them. I can answer yeah. just a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. First of all, Fatah was the only organization in the PLO. Oh, huh. Hamas, wait, let me finish. Who? Okay. Uh, that was led by Muslims. Uh, Fatah, uh, Yasser Arafat's a Muslim. Every single other organization including the one sponsored by Syria, the Palestine Liberation Front, there's, it's like the American left, just split all over the place, except they all have guns, <laughs> um, which is a good thing. Maybe we shouldn't be armed here. But uh, the, um, they're all Christian-led. Habash is a Christian, um, former Habash, head of the PFLP. All of them were, were Christian-led, which means that their, their general origin is in Ramallah on the West Bank. So here in the uh, diaspora, in the Bay Area, there are a large, the biggest single community of Palestinians are Christian Palestinians from, uh, many of them were, were from Ramallah. This is old, this is like from 25 years ago when I was working among Palestinians. It was completely people from Ramallah who supported vaguely Fatah. Hamas got big because Fatah was corrupt, is corrupt. The, P, the Palestinian Authority 
leadership has mansions in Switzerland. The money went from the United States to Israel to them to the bank accounts. Everybody sort of on the West Bank knows this. Ram Guess who won Ramallah? Christian city. Hamas won Ramallah. Because of the corruption. And when Hamas, and the other thing is when Hamas won the election in 2006 in Gaza, they won with the plurality. They didn't win with the majority. They haven't had an election since. Why? Because Fatah, with the support of the United States, tried to have a coup against them in, in 2007, less than a year later. So this ended up resulting in Hamas suppressing Fatah. They did not, my understanding is they didn't suppress the Democratic Front for Liberation of Palestine. Um, they, when one of their leaders died about two years ago, there was like 45,000 people in the street with red flags marching. So there is this real left that goes on in, you know, um, in, in, in there. But Hamas, you know, but just one more thing. I mean, I think the, the influence of Hamas has been really bad. And I, I say that because I'm a secularist. When I went to the West Bank in 19, when I was 13 and when I was 14, women had their hair out. They wore dresses. They, wore, they dressed like Israeli women to a large degree. They, Palestinians were the most secularized Arab-speaking people in the world. They were also the most educated people in the world. You go back today, and the influence of Islamification, which has, it's more than just Hamas that did this, but people who are Palestinian should probably speak up more about this, have influenced them, in my opinion, obviously not in their opinion, because they're, they've adopted is, is Islam more as they once did, which was passively Islamic, passively Muslim. So, you know, um, so I'm, I'm not a fan of Hamas, but they are the ones who did this and set this thing off, regardless. By the way, the, the Hamas's flag, green, right? They don't fly the, they don't fly the Palestinian flag. You, I, I didn't see one in the video that Hamas put up, the several videos when they hit uh, the Kibbutzim and all that. They were all wearing the green bandanas. Some people were wearing Palestinian flags. Not, I suspect they were not Hamas. You know, um, so that's, that's actually a big fight and difference in Gaza and on the West Bank. Hamas is winning. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, one thing I've heard you refer to often is the uh, death of the left and mm -hmm. like uh, how they're no longer around. Uh, I was wondering like what exactly you meant by that. Like, uh, Is there like an instance where it died or is there like something you can point to where it like went out? Kind of uh, I'm not a panelist, oh. um, but <laughs> perhaps Alice could take that on. I'll answer that, maybe. Yeah, I'll Please. try to answer it. Um, I've seen I that. Mean, um, yeah, the death of the left, I mean, you know, um, in, in my mind, the death of the left is, you know, I mean, is, is, uh, most no notoriously, it's obviously associated with the fall of the Soviet Union, because with the fall of the Soviet Union, you know, and all the monies that were given to the communist parties around the world, that didn't exist anymore, and it was in your face, and, 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 you know, literally communist parties around the world just shut up shop and went home, everyone went home, so they weren't a communist anymore, or not, you know? Um, but, but, I mean, of course, you know, their progression was, uh, historically, you know, 1968 destroyed the morale on, you know, uh, the, the, the 1968 was the, um, was the suppression of the Czech, um, spring, uh, rebellions. Oh, yeah, that's where the thing came from. Right, exactly. Yeah. Dubček. Right. And so, you know, I mean, there were, there were many, you know, incidents where the Soviet Union as the leader of the left in the world, you know, increasingly, you know, over time um, acted in ways that, you know, the international, that demoralized the international left, that demoralized people who were trying to build a better world, you know, who were idealistic. Um, and so, I mean, the death of the left, you know, I mean, another way that I think of it, the death of the left, is the fact that the left is, you know, splintered into a million different groups. You know, and I mean, since the fall of the Soviet Union, that has, you know, gone crazy, you know. Um, so, I mean, we'll see if it changes or not. I think it's going to take time to, to, to keep having discourse and so on and, and, you know, to develop programmatic unity on a large scale, which, you know, just takes time. But, but the death of the left, that's, that's what it means to me, you know, it's like that we're not powerful anymore, like we used to be. Right. Uh, maybe How CJ and or Jennifer. Uh, you go. Yeah, I'm going to add um, some things just to return to this, what I keep sort of emphasizing in terms of grounding in Palestinian studies, and one of them is, um, in, to your question in terms of histories of Hamas, um, Tark Barconi's work and then Samdeep Sen's work are both 
recent histories to consult. The other is this question is the question of indigenous studies, which is actually crucially important to Palestinian studies. And the the there has been a robust um, a, mer a robust literature around the utility of the frameworks of settler colonialism in relation to Palestine and indigenous studies in relation to Palestine. And one of the questions is. Um, the way that Veracini and Wolf, scholars, famous scholars of settler colonial studies, um, have the utility of those frameworks for analyzing Israeli state violence at the same time as the um, importance of indigenous studies for doing work on Palestine. And so authors um, who, there's an entire special issue around the question of settler colonial studies and indigenous studies in Palestine, Ron and Barakat's work is on the importance of indigenous studies as a framework, not to, and the way that it, settler colonial studies and indigenous studies are not synonymous and they do different work. Um, Brenna Bondar's P um, and Rafif Sayada's work, a short piece on the settler colonial studies in relation to Palestine and indigenous studies, um, Noor Judah's work, Leila Sharif's work, there are so many Palestinian scholars and Palestinian studies scholars and feminist Palestinian studies scholars who do the work of um, talking about indigeneity and talking about Palestine and talking about the the um, way that indigenous studies has shaped Palestinian studies and the way the Palestinian literature and scholarship has engaged with indigenous studies. And one sort of example from my field work, um, which was in 2020, um, 2019, um, what is a moment at the at the wall um, in Bethlehem where um, one of the solidarity tour guides was talking to a um, U.S. a white U.S. tourist who um, he was talking about the sort of papering over of Israeli names over Palestinian names across historic Palestine and she was like uh, expressing horror at that right and he said well what is the what is the name of the indigenous land on which you live and she said well I live in Baltimore or whatever like I don't I don't it, it, there is no indigenous name and he asked where are the indigenous people where you live? And she said, they're all dead. This is, and this is to, to your sort of um, point around thinking about indigenous studies as, or thinking about indigenous land back movements as past versus current, mm -hmm. right? So the, the indigenous people on the land on which she lived are not dead, right? They have um, a robust organizing um, tribal affiliation 30 minutes from her house. Right, but she imagined, so in, in her own critique of Israel, she gets to um, exonerate herself of her own settler identity and practice. And this is a really sort of common um, and important thing to name and diagnose in thinking through um, solidarity with Palestine, right? Is to think through settler colonial context, to think through land back, to support land back, in, not as a abstract theory, but as an actual practice of decolonization. Yeah. Uh, Be very yeah. brief on the death of the left. Sure, CJ, yeah. Our estimable hosts, the platypodes, have a thesis that the left is dead. Um, I do not agree. I do not agree. Uh, uh, you know, we have ongoing Communist Party-led guerrilla wars to build socialism happening in India, in Turkey. Um, um, Philippines. You know, yes, and in the Philippines, the, the communist-controlled areas are the only places where you can have a, a labor union without getting shot where you can have a gay wedding, where you can vote um, for who runs your, your farm or your, or your workshop, uh, I would argue that that's very much a living left. And of course in Palestine, right, the PFLP are actively shooting missiles at the enemy. I think if you told them they were dead, they would laugh at you. And then, you know, they'd probably shoot a missile at you. They wouldn't. They'd be friendly, but, but they would say that they're not dead. Um, that's, that's so far as the left is dead. No, it isn't. Uh, Kevin? Uh, yeah, I want to maybe jump off uh, that question and also what CJ brings up. So first of all, thanks to all the panelists for uh, the discussion so far. It's been quite lively. It's uh, much on your question, too, uh, just, just before you go, too. Yeah. So, oh. uh, so I have a Palestinian uh, friend, and I often tell him about my forays into learning about the history of the left. And this Palestinian friend is not a leftist by any means. 
And he always tells me, man, that's some bullshit you're on, right? Like, you don't really need the left and its history to argue for Palestinian liberation or solidarity today. And I often find myself at a, it's like hard to give a direct answer to him uh, on that question because, you know, maybe he's like actually correct and maybe I'm the crackpot who's talking about the left the death of the left, or Marxism, or anything like this. So my question to the panelists is, does one need the left and its history to argue for more exigent stuff involving Palestinian liberation or solidarity today? And if one does, what's the path from that to, say, World Socialist Revolution? Because the goal of leftists in the distant <coughs> path was world revolution to inaugurate socialism. That seems kind of like a utopian, like the Mormons, like David was talking about. And on the other hand, if, you, if not, if one doesn't need that, then what in your like lifetime uh, convinced you that uh, you don't really need the leftist ideology or history in order to argue for the liberation of the Palestinians? And here's where I thought uh, Jennifer's presentation and its sort of light on ideology aspect was perhaps from the perspective of this Palestinian friend, the most quote unquote honest. And the other three panelists, David, Alex, and CJ, brought up a lot of stuff from the history of the left, ranging from the mainstream to the Arcania. So stuff like Mats Peng, also Kautsky, who's a German Marxist from the early uh, 20th century uh, all the way to, uh, you know, uh, stuff from David, uh, David's upbringing, the communists then. So I was wondering if you guys could address uh, that concern. Does one need the history of the left to address Palestinian liberation? If so, what in the past made it so that one does? But if not, what convinced you otherwise? And I'd like to hear from all the panelists here on this question. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, Alex, okay. Go first. Go with that. Um, I mean, the reason why I would say yes, you do need the history of the left. Uh, you know, I, I don't. I don't even want to say that you need the history of the left so much as to say that uh, the history of the left can be useful to um, organize um, a solidarity movement that can actually have a real impact um, in aiding oppressed peoples, like the Palestinian people. Um, so, you know, I, th I think, you know, it's in human nature uh, as a worker to, to be, uh, the reality of being a worker under capitalism, it makes you uh, need to be cooperative. You have to be. Um, I speak from my own experience. I was a worker, you know, since I'm 12 years old, I was working random jobs. And uh, it, it forces you to be cooperative, the reality of work, um, of modern capitalist work. Um, and I think, you know, uh, the, the power that the working class does have, you know, that it could have if it were conscious of it, um, is, is, is a great power, you know. Uh, I mean, you know, the other day I was reading that Netanyahu is really worried that all these protests in the United States and Europe and, and the, the sentiment of, of the populations of the West are going to threaten arms deliveries to Israel, which, you know, already the United States has gone and taken a million shells and sent them to Ukraine a couple months before all this happened. And uh, so that's a real worry, and, and people do have power, you know. Um, people can go in the streets, and people can actually uh, have an impact. Um, so I, I, to that extent, I, I think, yeah, the history of the left is important in terms of inspiring people, if nothing else, to get active. David? Yeah, I agree with what Alex said about that. I think you're the first one who brought up the question of a proletarian orientation. Because the problem with, I, when, when Platypus a few years ago came up with the thing about the left is dead, I, I, my first thought of, who are they to decide that? <laughs> Two, who cares? Three, I don't even use the word left. I mean, I told Kevin this a few times, I think. I, I, when I was growing up, we didn't use the word left to the, the workers' movement which meant the labor movement and the socialist movement, or the socialist movement, or the Marxist movement. The left, the, the left has become a relative term. So, you know, Biden is now the left, if you listen to MSNBC or C CNN. It's, I just like, okay, fine. Because the ruling class can co-opt anything. They co-opt the Black Lives Matter. Cadillac commercials with Black Lives I couldn't believe it. I thought I was watching this radical thing, like during Black Lives Matter. And it was that, 
Cadillac commercial. So it's very easy to, for terminology to be called. I just say the, the workers' movement, the labor movement, the socialist movement. Um, or I'll say the socialist left. So I just want to get that out of the way. But you're right. It doesn't the class, Palestine would happen with or without the left. You do see what can happen when the left is weaker. Because Hamas is not on the left. I mean, I don't consider it a left group. It's, it, when, when the leaders were interviewed, they said they, we reject the concept of national liberation. This is back in the day when they still hated Jews, you know, in their, in their, the covenant from 1988. But it wasn't, I never considered it a left wing any more than I do Hezbollah, which has suppressed unions throughout southern Lebanon. I mean, it's, the Islamic groups are Islamic groups. Fatah, which was, which is left wing, also was Muslim, but in a tradition of the 60s left wing Muslim groups, um, which the Syrian regime and the Iraqi regime co-opted. Um, but, you know, the class struggle goes on. This is the key word. Class struggle happens whether or not there is a left or not. And new leadership will come to the fore to develop this. This happened in 2010 with the CSU struggle um, on all the campuses in California. It was the folk, the anvil for the class struggle in the United States was the, with the unions and the student movement against tuition hikes in the in 2000s. And it was a great, it was happened during Occupy. It, it was, None of this came, none of that came out of a traditional left. We, my group, we were involved with it, and we did, I thought we did good work. Other groups did too. But there was a huge, like, the, the rise of the, these, the anarchist collectives, the rise of what was called the New Left, um, the struggle group in Oakland, um, there's groups in Portland and Seattle. So groups do come up. Whether or not they had the focus, the, Lenin talked about and what is to be done about, the, the whole point is to develop class consciousness. Say what you want about Lenin, that he's right on that. So the issue is to develop with the working class, to organize workers in unions, working staff on campuses, um, in the communities. That should be the orientation, not to sit around and bemoan the issue that the left is dead. I, because I, the reason I said that, I brought it up about Platypus, is because I actually agree with them now. <laughs> I think the, I disagree with them. I agree with Alex. All the internationals are dead. You know, all the, the, most of the political parties even those that appear really active are not leading sections of the working class. PSL, which is the big group that organizes demonstrations, to name names, it, it, it did incredible work in organizing these things, but they, 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 they're not leading anything. They're just recruiting people. It's, it's not the same thing. You know, they're not sending people to the unions. They're not going to Amazon organizing workers. And that's kind of what you need. You need this revitalization of class struggle consciousness. Uh. So. Mm -hmm. So I think it depends deeply on who you consider the left and what you consider the left. And, and I think uh, several things. One is that people come to their politics in many different ways. And some people come to their politics through theory. And some people come to their politics through organizing and activism. And there are multiple different ways to come to your politics. I think one way into Palestinian liberation struggles is through feminist and queer organizing and feminist and queer histories. And I, it, it depends, so it's interesting to, to, to think about the positioning as the left, like with that absented in a lot of ways. And one thing that I think is really crucial is that, so in, a, in a 2011 at a homonationalism and pinkwashing conference, um, organized by Sarah Shulman in the wake of a queer delegation to Palestine, uh, one of the queer Palestinian organizers asked the audience, are you in solidarity with queer Palestinians or are you in solidarity with Palestine? And I think that question is crucial and it gets to the question that you're asking in a different way because it uh, is what that question is asking is like, do you require a litmus test that is deserving of your solidarity and that litmus test is um, s certain books or certain theories on the on the what you consider the left, right? Or do you base your solidarity on support for freedom from freedom under colonial occupation, right? Freedom, colonial struggles for freedom, and so that question stays with me, right? Like, are you in solidarity with queer Palestinians? Are you? Is your solidarity based on likeness? Is your solidarity based on a um, shared set of reading practices, right? Or is your solidarity based on um, a consistent critique of decolonization everywhere that you find it, right? Who, who asked the question? Hanin Mikey, who was the um, one of, who was co-founder of Al-Khaos, which is a queer Palestinian organization in Jerusalem. And 
So I think that's um, a, a critically important question, and I think that it actually has to do with also this the question of of Christian Palestinian organizers, because a lot of times one of the the, the um, one of the things, one of the sort of more surprising things in my research was the amount of solidarity tour, tourists who are um, Christian youth pastors in the U.S. and they're Christian, Christian youth pastors in the U.S. who come to Palestine to um, reshape their congregation's relationship to Zionism in response to Christian Zionism, which is ubiquitous and rampant and 80% of the Republican voting, voting bloc, right? And and John Hagee, who founded Christians United for Israel, spoke at the pro-Israel rally, right, on Washington. Mm -hmm. um, and so what happens often is what what sort of happens where Christian organizers can look to Christian Palestinians um, in a way that is actually also Islamophobic, right? That supports, that is in solidarity with Christian Palestinians, but not in solidarity with Palestine. So I think this is another question of like, what what are the parameters of your sol solidarity? And is your solidarity contingent on some demonstration of likeness? And it's an important question to continue to ask yourself, right? As you think about like, what matters to a liberation struggle and what, what and also like, what is, who is, the art like this kind of question of like who is the arbiter of what gets to constitute the left what gets to constitute a liberation struggle um and what gets to constitute self solidarity all right uh, cj you want to respond to that at all or well i think uh uh you're absolutely right regarding at least as i understand it like like conditional solidarity that um i mean the revolt of the oppressed right the the will of a of a of a repressed person or group to, to resolve the contradiction of their repression, to free themselves, is justified whether they've read the Grundrisse or not. Um, and, you know, Palestinians who vote for the PFLP and Palestinians who vote for Hamas are both being bombed out, and they're, uh, you know, they, they both should not be bombed, um, of course. With that being said, and I don't think this contradicts that, I think this is a, this is a complementary truth to that. Um, Yes, I think the thought of the left, or shall we say more specifically the philosophical analysis of Marxism, is useful in sort of refining what, what a struggle can do and, and how it can not, how it can tell people what goals are right and what goals are wrong, but how it can reach its goals um, by answering essentially why questions, right? That's what philosophy is for. Um, why are the Palestinians being colonized? Why are women treated the way they are? Why is it that, that um, you know, states around the world uh, uh, arrest us for murder but, but are also fine with, with the murder that is involved in the production of resources? With the, 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 all these questions. Why is it that the university loves to talk about the Amamutsin used to live here and, and you know, they've been kicked out to, to, what, north of here, to San Francisco, um, but then it never actually does anything to let them take their land back and govern it, which is a thing I wanted to emphasize that I... I certainly would not say that, that the na indigenous nations of this land are a thing of the past, and that's not what I was trying to say, and I apologize if I was unclear. Um, you, you know, I, because it isn't, it isn't just because this or that person is evil, right, that somebody's being oppressed. The fact that Palestine is being colonized isn't because Netanyahu or Theodore Herzl or whoever is evil or a hypocrite or bad. Um, and say, we, say every member of the Knesset died right now, uh, that wouldn't fix everything. Um, it wouldn't, right? There are institutions and there are structures that create the iniquities and the contradictions that we see in the world. And we are better able to correct them if we understand where they've come from and where they're going and why they're going there, you know? Uh, uh, why is it, is it so desirable for the state to, you know, penalize one... Pol to, to, to penalize... Um, resistance in Palestine and rewarded in Ukraine. It's more complicated than just like a coin flip, right? It has to do with economics. It has to do with imperialism. It has to do with the global export of finance capital. And I think understanding that, while it doesn't, it's not the deciding factor of whether or not your struggle is legitimate, but it will help you to um, carry out that struggle in the most efficient way and in the way that ultimately is most likely to set you free. Um, you know, I, it's not my place to tell the Palestinians what they should and should not believe, but I think the more Palestinian resistance is connected with the global, international, socialist left, the more likely it is to win. Um, 
and that's what they want. That's what I want. That's what you know. That's even, they might not agree with me on how to achieve it, but that's what the average Hamas supporter wants. Um, is is you know stop killing us, stop taking away our homes, and I think it helps to understand why your homes are being taken away. All right, thanks, TJ. Um, anyone else from the audience have any uh, queries for the panelists? Don't pick up anything that's been said. Yeah. I know y'all are just people and you won't have all the answers, but if it was your decision to make, where would we go from here? How would we achieve a ceasefire and ultimately peace in the Middle East for this? Notice I'm not sticking my hand up right away. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think. Oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Oh, I just. I. Th I mean, I think I appreciate that you started with ceasefire, right? Because I think that understanding and immediacy in organizing is important work. Um, I think that the this sort of um, coordinated outrage, the pouring into the streets, the calls to represent it, like all of this is indexing um, shifts. I can tell you f from an academic perspective, you know, I did my PhD in American studies. Um, I started working on Palestine 15 years ago. The association, the academic associations that have started, ha that have supported boycott resolutions, boycott divestment and sanctions resolutions have um, flowered since then, right? Before in the early my early grad career, that was like unthinkable. Then there was all this organizing in my home association of American Studies to support the boycott resolutions, and then there was NWSA, and then there was an Asian American Studies, and sort of all of these um, critical ethnic studies and feminist studies and queer studies support for Palestine. So the terrain shifts all the time. The terrain is shifting all the time, um, and I think that that people are horrified and demanding a ceasefire immediately. The the short term of that is is I think all of the organizing that's saying like ceasefire and, right? Ceasefire as a bare minimum um, toward liberation, right? And I think that there I think the answers of this question again are in the scores of of literature Palestinians have produced on their own condition and the, the scores of literature Palestinians have produced on what the future of liberation looks like in Palestine. And again, one of the things, one of the reasons that solidarity tourism exists as a practice, one of the reasons that internationals come to Palestine to see for themselves what is happening in Palestine is because Palestinians are not believed as narrators and Palestinians are not treated as reliable narrators of their own condition so internationals have to come to see it to believe it in order to corroborate Palestinian narratives and you see that right now right as every moment we're watching a genocide live streamed on Instagram and and we're watching Israel bomb hospitals and universities and hearing that Palestinians are bombing themselves right and hearing that and at the same time the palestinians are writing the names of their children on their limbs so that they cannot be identified we're hearing that palestinians use their children as human shields right so i think all of the work of insisting that palestinians be treated as reliable narrators of their own condition is incumbent on all of us that's work that is incumbent on all of us and that's work toward liberation as well so i think what we're what you're asking is pointing to a ceasefire now, but also pointing to a refusal, a, a, a commitment to intervene in that racist warmongering wherever you see it, right, in the service of liberation, a, a an insistence on reading Palestinian literature in the service of liberation, a, an insistence on looking toward how Palestinians in exile have described what their futures would look like post-return, an insistence on doing that work, committing to that work, and intervening in all of the the warmongering and, and anti-Palestinian racism that, that treats Palestinians as always already suspect. Mm -hmm. right, anyone else like to respond to that? Uh, I'll just, uh, Alex, I'll, it's first, yeah. Yeah, I'll just say real quick, um, with regard to what Jennifer just mentioned, um, the the kind of coverage of the war um, as you know Palestinians bombing themselves and crap like that um, 
That is, you know, that's a direct, uh, that's a direct result of the relationship between the United States and U.S. imperialism and Israel. So we're not, you know, I mean, a ceasefire, like, let's hope it happens, like, call your senator, call your congressman, like, you know, just like, how else is it going to happen? Um, and support Palestinian voices in fighting, you know, fighting this, you know. Um, but, um, but beyond that, like, I think, you know, uh, as we've kind of discussed here, the state of Israel is an apartheid state, and you know it's it's a, it's an ethnic, so much for you. religious e ethnic state, and um, you know I don't think it's going to be able to be uh, changed without uh, without significant changes in Israel, you know, to to actually make it a democratic state, and it's going to take you know the seven million Israelis, you know, to actually accept that. So I, I okay. you know, no. Okay. You good. So peace in the Middle East is an old chestnut of a phrase, um, and you know it raises interesting questions because what is the Middle East? I mean, where, did, where, where does that start and end? Are we talking about Palestine? Are we talking about Saudi Arabia? Um, but but I would say the first thing is get imperialist militaries and imperialist finance capital investments out right now and don't put them back. Um, and and when the, you know when the Chinese and the Imper and the Russian and the U.S. imperialists have left, don't bring in new ones. And don't tell me some nonsense about how they're fighting terrorists, because every time the U.S. fights terrorists, they manage to invent a new terrorist group, right? They go into Iraq to stop Al-Qaeda, and by stopping Al-Qaeda, they invented Daesh. And now, you, you know, in, in 2017, you have a situation where Daesh is selling the oil to be put in the drones that are supposedly fighting Daesh. And meanwhile, both the oil companies and the drone companies are making a fortune. Um, stop doing that. Secondly, I've already said what I think peace looks like in Palestine. I think it looks like a singular, democratic, united, secular, independent republic, um, which is not constitutionally wedded to any one ethnicity or any one religion, and which is not built upon settlement and dispossession. Um, I'm a Marxist. Ultimately, I would like to see a global communist world not separated by borders. But in practice, I think the people of Palestine, before they can seriously work on building that, um, have a, a, a reasonable desire and a need to have a country of their own in which they can live and breathe and think without being bombed every second. Um, so that's what I think peace looks like, right, is a democratic secular Republic of Palestine, which isn't divided up into nonsense Swiss cheese. Um, as far as what does the constitution of that state look like, I haven't the faintest idea, and I don't think it's my role or my right to say what that looks like. Um, I think people like the PFLP have to write that constitution. Um, and once they've done that, then I'll tell you what I think of it. But it's their place to write it, and I would never usurp that from them. Um, also regarding a ceasefire, I would echo what you said. Ceasefire now, yes, insofar as, as stop blowing up hospitals. But it's important that what does ceasefire now and nothing else mean uh, well, it means a return to what things were back, what what things were like, say this time last year, which wasn't good. Um, so ceasefire is not sufficient. Ceasefire is not justice. Um, ceasefire is a return to slow genocide instead of rapid genocide. Uh, uh, I don't necessarily agree with what you said that the solution ultimately comes politically, th not through violence. I guess I wish that was true. I think there will be a war of liberation. Um, I think it, it will not be good, um, but it will be necessary. And, and um, I don't know, I think that's a necessary condition to have your democratic secular republic. I wish it wasn't, but I think it probably is. At some point, the IDF will have to be militarily defeated. Can I respond to that real quick? Yes, go ahead. I'll just clarify that. I mean, I don't, I don't disagree that you know a, a secular democratic Palestinian state uh, is going to have to assert its monopoly on violence, you know, and that that's going to run into some issues. <laughs> but the question is, you know, there's seven million uh, Jews in Israel that you know uh, have the IDF that have nuclear bombs. So I mean, I we haven't even talked about the implications of this. You know, I mean, literally, like. You know, what if the nuclear bomb? Yeah, well, Israel has nuclear bombs, and I mean, it's impossible to to it's it's nearly impossible to get rid of Israel as it is without uh, um, a political solution from the United States. You know, aiding some kind of a political uh, change in Israel. 
Um, and so without American imperialism changing, without America's, you know, blind support to Israel, to Zionism, um, it, there, it's going to be, it's going to be, you know, pandemonium. I mean, I'm sorry, but the Israeli state is not going to go through violence because it has nuclear bombs. Um, and if it does go through violence, then we're all fucked. And, and, and that's not a condemnation of violence, you know, but it, it's just military math. You know. right. Okay, uh, just allowed to ask questions, because that raises a question I'd like to hear your opinion on and that I have thoughts on, um, which is what is the role of the technically officially non-existent, but everyone knows it's real, Israeli nuclear weapons program? How important is it? What should we think about it? Does anybody want to take that up, or does anyone else have any other questions uh, from the audience, personally, concerning, you know, the prompt? I can read the prompt again if anyone would like that. <laughs> uh, we were just addressing the question. I think you left, Kevin. Would you be okay if you read the prompt again? Oh, sure, yeah. With an eye towards specific moments and epochs from the history of the left, how has the left historically approached the question of Israel-Palestine? How does the imagination of leftists today, as concerns what is to be done about the current ongoing Israel-Palestine conflict, fall below the threshold of what leftists in the past thought was possible? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, that kind of ties to what we were just talking about, actually, because, you know, back in the day, um, you know, 1960s, 1970s, uh, it, was a, it was a very valid belief uh, uh, that, uh, you know, international socialism, communism, whatever, uh, um, countries arming uh, the Vietnamese people or, or other peoples around the world that were colonized, it was a very valid belief to militarily defeat the enemy. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I mean, nuclear weapons changes the game, mm -hmm. in my opinion, especially when you're dealing with a state that is so radical like Israel. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a radical ethnic state. So, um, you know, that, that ties into the prompt as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I know, Jennifer, you mentioned in passing how this genocide is being live streamed on Instagram. And so I guess it kind of raises a bigger question for mm -hmm. me about what role has social media played in the current, um, I guess, understanding of what is going on, both in terms of awareness being spread, if you can mm -hmm. use that phrase seriously, uh, but also in terms of like a growing fatalism, just you know, from seeing so much suffering, what role does social media play? What role, I guess, should it play, if any, uh, both in terms of um, envisioning a like Palestinian resistance, but then also envisioning like an international resistance I guess, facilitated through social media, something like that? I mean, I think it's impossible to suggest that social media is is irrelevant, right, in this mm -hmm. moment. It's, it's so crucial in terms of, um, especially when you're facing complete media blackouts, especially when you're facing complete, like, I can't overstate the significance of something like the House Resolution 894 last night, right? Or the earlier one, or the, you know, I'm on the founding collective of the Institute for the Critical Study of Zionism, the backlash we faced in the summer, organizing the conference, which was a um, interrogation of, diagnosis of and resistance to the IRA definition, which conflates anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism. And given that ubiquity, like, on a campus level, on a U.S. like political level, on an administrative level, um, the ubiquity of that notion that to criticize Israel is to um, be anti-Semitic, right? To criticize Zionism is to be anti-Semitic. The ubiquity of that compared with the um, cutting through of so much of the of the social media. Um, journalists, right? Like I, I talked to like a small business owner in Aptos who was talking to me about Plestia and talking to me about Bisan and talking to me about different journalists in Gaza who are risking their lives every day, who people, 
who have never been connected to Palestine know their names mm -hmm. and know their work and know their reporting and are waking up every day to check if what they posted, right? And so this, this kind of um, insistence on outreach, insistence on um, narrative, narrativizing, like insistence on documenting when 70 journalists now have been killed in Gaza, right? When it, 70 journalists. So the, and that, that kind of journalism is also, I think the other, the other aspect of it um, that a lot of people are sort of flagging right now is that kind of um, immediate audience-based um, unfiltered posting, right? On Instagram live, on, Inst on stories versus like Hasbara versus like orchestrated Israeli um, propaganda and the kinds of, of efforts that that have, if you look at something like, and this is why it's important, like in terms of these questions about like what histories do you need to know, one of the histories you need to know is Palestinian organizing history, even recent history, even since the BDS call in 2005, right? Which was also in response to and in the, the sort of world of brand Israel, which has been an, a complete um, Israeli um, propaganda machine to position Israel as a beacon of democracy in the Middle East, to position Israel as a, an oasis for queers, to position Israel as like some kind of feminist haven, like blah, 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 like all of these, this entire machinery meant to, like one of my next projects is about the... Um, like funded trips for influencers to go to Israel who are given hashtags, who are given places to go and told what to say about how like beautiful and amazing and diverse Israel is, right? So this, this um, the ubiquity of that and the history of that and the, the sort of funding that has gone into that versus the like raw immediacy of reporting on the ground from journalists in Gaza, I think is actually, is something that can only be understood through an, an analysis of social media. And the other thing that I would say to that too is, and this gets to like our own camp, and this is why this question of like helplessness is so important because as students, you have a right to demand what you learn, right? And so the like campus, I'm sure you all saw the, um, the missive critiquing SJP for shutting down the intersection, right? Oh and the missive critiquing SJP for shutting down the intersection was um, predicated on the weaponization of, of disability, was saying that like the SJP shutting down the intersection um, harmed our most vulnerable students, so speaking in the name of the most vulnerable students, um, weaponizing diversity to, or we weaponizing diversity and disability to sanction SJP, right? Assume, and in in the face of what was so beautiful, what was a, an entire group of people shutting down an intersection to create an ofrenda to talk about the, the those murdered in Palestine, right? And so, social media is not, is part of all of this, but it's also about I think that it's I think what we're witnessing is also a um, growing demand on the part of youth across multiple spectrums. Um, to insist that Palestine belongs in their classrooms, to insist that Palestine belongs on their campuses, to um, refuse to buy, buy into this kind of like, one meme was talking about like dusting off 9-11 brains, right? Like to refuse to believe, to refuse it, basically, to refuse it. And like that was one of the conversations that I had with, with this person in, in where I live, which, who was just like, not someone I would ever expect to be able to talk about my research with, but who was not only naming them by name, but also saying like, no one, we don't believe that anymore. Like we're not gonna fall for that this time. And I think that that, there's like a, a very real, there's something very real about that. And I think that that, um, that social media plays an important role. And what I was gonna say to connect it to sort of like demanding Palestine belong in your classrooms is part of Part of the work of, of saying that it doesn't is this idea that's coming from the chancellors and coming from UCOP that we are not allowed as faculty to turn our classrooms over to politics, right? Or to turn our classrooms over to political advocacy. As though in the humanities and social science, we do not always discuss what's happening in the world, right? As though we don't always pause class and talk about what's happening. And so insisting, so like fighting the backlash wherever you see it, but also demanding that those um, administ that, that administrative messaging, like diagnosing it for what it is, right? And being able to say clearly what that messaging is doing 
and refusing it is I think a part of the process of this particular moment we're in, in terms of, of watching a genocide happen every day, right? And refusing to be either desensitized to it or um, explain it away or t turn away from it, right? And instead insisting that, that the analysis of not only the genocide, but also the analysis of all of the kinds of like reporting, all of the racist descriptions of Palestinians everywhere is, is part of what we do in our classrooms in terms of analyzing rhetoric, in terms of analyzing representational practice, in terms of analyzing the media. Right. Yeah. Add a little bit. Um, maybe we could make these into closing remarks. So like. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. We'll fold this into uh, closing remarks for you guys. I think that was uh, good, Jennifer, to have uh, wrapped up some of your other uh, concerns as well. So yeah, CJ. Well, first of all, I sh I share your what I interpret as profound disdain for the for the the condemnation of, of the blocking at the intersection. First of all, as if this campus was accessible to begin with, as if it's not the hilliest fucking place in the universe, you know as if anybody could, could roll a wheelchair up Empire Great. Um, second of all, uh, sort of just the, the tone deafness, right? Blockading uh, non-essential goods for what, about three hours is fine, is, is terrible. Uh, blockading everything for what, you know, years, decades. Um, oh, and also blowing up a bunch of people. Well, that's okay. And if you say otherwise, it's too political. Um, as far as social media, it's very popular, right, in the left to kind of be dismissive of social media. You know, you're not truly politically involved if you're not on the streets. I think that's true. I think you should get out on the streets. But I also think, as you said, it's undeniable that social media plays a role, and I think it's been valuable here. Um, why are people beginning to break out of this, what I call the mind trap of the two-state solution? Why are people beginning to again realize that imagining a democratic, secular, united world and a democratic, secular, united Palestine is possible, that it is not anti-Semitic to say there need not be an Israel? Um, because they can hop on their phone and take a look at Palestine, right? Um, um, they can do it very easily. I could do it right now. Uh, I think that's huge. I think that's colossal. I think it's a profound, you know, you use the phrase raw immediacy, I think. That's a really good phrase. Um, because media has never had raw immediacy before. It's, I mean, it, it's still filtered, but it's, it's far less filtered than it's ever been in the past. Um, I am no longer limited in what I can hear about Palestine by what net TV networks there are, or what, what publishing houses have the capital to sell books, or like you know, what professors do and don't get fired. Um, I can take a look at, at on the internet and, and learn about Palestine. I want to add, and it's only tan it's kind of tangential, but I think I'll make it a closing remark because it's something that's been poignant to me and I'd encourage you all to look at it. Um, the thing that has, more than anything else, I think, been valuable in kind of breaking people I know out of the pinkwashing element of... of Israeli and Zionist propaganda, there's a wonderful website um, called Queering the Map, the purpose of which is that anyone anywhere in the world, and you know, anybody can do it, so you could make up bullshit, but most stories on it seem fairly credible, can drop a pin on a map and, and tell their story of experiencing queerness in the world. Um, and so we have this narrative, right, that there are only gay people in Israel, and there couldn't possibly be any gay people in Gaza because they would immediately, magically destroy, be destroyed by the evil Islamic, you know, death laser. Um, you can go on this website, and you can you can see hundreds and hundreds of data points in Gaza, and you can click on them, and you can read about how yes, of course, these people are impacted by Muslim homophobia. They don't live in paradise. Their neighbors are cruel to them, but you can also read again and again about you know, lesbians and gay men and transgender people who have had their loved ones taken from them by the occupation. And every single one of them, uh, whether they're posting from the diaspora or whether they're posting from in Gaza or in the West Bank, um, every single one of them stands with the resistance. And every single one of them rec rec recognizes that the history and the present of their oppression intimately is tied to the history and present of the oppression of the Palestinian nation. It's a beautiful website, and um, I think it fantastically captures what the raw immediacy of, of online media can do for opening avenues of international solidarity. 
I encourage everyone to go look at it. It's, it's, it will make you cry, but it's, you know, that will demonstrate to you what social media can do for international solidarity. All right, uh, and now Alex, if you want to uh, respond to any of the just loose ends and uh, have forty remarks. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, I'll just say, you know, um, everything that we're seeing through social media um, nowadays, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's heartbreaking, and uh, um, in, in a way, you know, um, the struggle in Palestine is a struggle that, you know, has to touch people on, on a human level, and it's touching, like, more people than I've ever witnessed in my life. Ten years ago, I remember, especially European media, Germany, where I'm from, mm -hmm. there was a little bit more sympathy than here back then, but not a ton of sympathy with the Palestinian cause. But now, through social media, the fact that people are risking their lives, you know, journalists are getting blown up at all the time. They're almost at, well, more than every day, you know. Um, to, to expose the inhumanity of what Israel is doing. Um, that is something that is very valuable. Um, and I'll just make the point that, you know, more so than humanity, I think there's something that, uh, uh, you know, like David said earlier, um, the class struggle goes on in every country. It's a reality. Um, and uh, the reality of class struggle, the reality of being a worker, um, is that you have to be cooperative. Because otherwise you get fired. You know, um, so um, th there's a power there. You know, there's a power there, and, and the, the the Marxist idea of the proletariat. There's a real power there because historically it has been utilized to great effect to 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 stop machines from moving, um, to to have revolutions, to overthrow tyranny, and that's the dream that I think is worth uh, harping on. All right. Well, uh, thank you everybody who uh, was interested enough to make it through this, and um, yeah, thank you to our panelists. Uh,